Okay, it's Christmas time, and around Christmas time we think about our kiddos. So today we're going to talk about how we test kids' hearing. Hi guys, I'm Dr. Michael Squires. And I'm Dr. Carly Squires. This is Dr. Squires Squared. This is a channel where we have candid and casual conversations about anything and everything audiology. And if you're not sure what audiology is, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, keep up with all of our content and we're going to tell you all about it. Yes. All right, so like Michael mentioned, it is Christmas time. We're thinking about those kiddos and we wanted to address how we test kids. Um, it's a, a pretty common question that I get asked by my adult patients and they ask things like, how do you even get re reliable results from little kiddos? So we, what we thought we'd do today is give a brief overview about from newborn all the way up through school age and how we get those results and what kind of testing goes into that. Yeah, some of those techniques. Mm -hmm. So starting at newborn, mm -hmm. typically what the hospitals will have is a newborn hearing screening protocol. Most states kind of um, have their own protocols mm -hmm. um, from, from the CDC and uh, EHDI, which is the early detection, early hearing detection detection um, group. But what those screenings are going to do is give a pass fail. Mm -hmm. And for those kiddos who maybe don't pass those uh, evaluations, then they'd get referred for diagnostic testing. Right. And so for a newborn, for in our in our office, for example, we're actually using testing that does not require behavioral results. Or what we mean by that is the the child doesn't have to tell us if they're hearing something or right participate. or participate because in fact, they're it's better if they're sleeping yes yeah, so we encourage moms and um, guardians to try to um we're, we're going to be getting that child to sleep during the testing so that they are nice and calm and we can just measure some responses that are involuntary from the auditory system that we can measure with simple testing with little their electrodes but they're like little stickers that we're going to have just um, placed different places on their heads some little pieces in their ears and it's uh, the baby doesn't have to do a thing except sleep so nope. we can get what no we love testing our oh. babies around here we got <laughs> yeah. all excited when the babies come in yes. but but it's nice because it like carly said it doesn't require any voluntary mm -hmm. responses so if the child's sleeping it gives us a really good idea of how that auditory system and brain stem are working together um and, and basically what that child is able to hear but it doesn't give us information about detection right. we have to wait until they're a little bit older in order to get some of that uh, information yeah so when they're about six months old give mm -hmm. or take every child is different developmentally too so i do want to say that um it's it's definitely dependent on your child as to what testing that we, would be appropriate so that's an important discussion to have with your audiologist for sure um, but in general, right around six months of age, we're able to get some behavioral or sound detection responses from the child. And the way we do this is we're just simply looking for localization, or not even localization, but just a head turn. Just, just head turn. do you hear it? Um, where is it coming from? Um, so explain how we do that. Yep. Yeah, so we use a technique called visual reinforcement. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a type of testing called visual reinforcement audiometry, in which we play sounds out of a speaker. So we put the kids in, in a booth. Um, and, in, and hopefully a booth that's large enough that you mm -hmm. can get those speakers away from them and that they feel comfortable. Um, so we're playing sounds. Sometimes it's our voice. Sometimes it's, you know, beeping or like little chirps mm -hmm. through speakers. And we're looking for a head turn. We're, we're hoping that that child will actually look for that sound. Mm -hmm. And the visual reinforcement part of that is some toys. So we've got toys that light up by the speakers mm -hmm. um, that kind of give them that reinforcement that, hey, that was a fun thing to do. So the next time they hear that beep, they're looking, they're looking for it. They're looking for the toy now. They're looking for the toy, yeah. Um, but we can get some, uh, if we can get that child to really uh, engage in that task, then we can get some really reliable results. Mm -hmm. The caveat to that is that we're, presumably testing the better ear if there is one. So if the child has, um, for example, a unilateral hearing loss, it may show up as normal hearing right. because in the sound field, they're using both ears at the same time. It's not necessarily ear specific. Right, so from, so, Sometimes, though, kiddos, even at six months of age, tolerate us putting headphones on right. or little insert buds in their ears, and that's even better because then, like Michael said, we can actually get ear-specific information and find out what each ear is doing by itself, um, which we'll talk a little bit about some techniques on that here, here shortly, but kind of moving on to what happens when the kids are 
between that two and three year old uh, time where, okay, that to toy is boring. I don't wanna look for sounds anymore. This is not exciting. So then we have to move on to some other tasks. And what we like to do is play some fun games um, to be able to associate sound with, with that game. It's really important for parents to remember, if you've ever had your child tested or, or your grandchild tested or you're planning on it, mm -hmm. it's really important to remember that around this age, it's not uncommon to do it in multiple visits mm -hmm. exactly. um, and try to put those puzzle pieces together. That, for boys, it's that one and a half to three. For girls, it, it tends to be a little a little bit more closer to that two to three range, but they get really bored with the task mm. really fast. They're more advanced than playing with toys, but they're not quite up to um, some of the games that we ha that we play. Mm -hmm. So doing it in multiple visits is is not uncommon. Right. But the games that we play are fun. It's mm -hmm. like listen and drop. So we have like pennies in a can. So we lit hold our penny up and we listen and we drop it in. Um, mm -hmm. Or we've got animals or we've got mm -hmm. frogs. or mm -hmm. But it's always a listen and do type of task. Right. That gives us the most robust um, response. Yeah, and it, it tends to be pretty reliable when they get into that, that task. Um, and it can even be as simple as, okay, when you hear the sound, give me a high five. Yep. Or say a, a funny word when you hear the sound. I and mean, it can yep. be a variety of different color? things. Yeah, yeah. So, and those are actually things that you um, as parents and guardians and siblings, you can get siblings involved to actually prepare for that visit. Um, the most important thing that we like to tell um, parents and guardians is get your kids familiar with and comfortable with touching the ears. Yeah, people so, looking in and touching the right. ears. Right, so even just, you know, touching, looking, have a sibling do it. I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> He's comfortable with it. So, so that will help us a lot because we have to look in there, we might have headphones on, and that just helps ease that child into that testing. Um, the other thing is, is practicing those games at home. And that's something that you can definitely do just with the things that you have around your house. Um, looking for sound, asso associating sound with a game like we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do that with, uh, with any kind of toys that you have around the house where you play a listening game where you hold, you hold it up with the child. Oh, I hear that. Let's put it in the bucket when I hear that sound. So preparing them for those types of activities and listening for and doing something in response to the sound, that would help prepare a lot. Another really good a, a really another good another really good thing to to think about is getting the kid comfortable with wearing like earbuds mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, it's it's all fun and games until somebody puts something in your ear, <laughs> and um, then kids tend to be a little bit more reserved with that. Mm -hmm. So if you can get them used to, or just go get some cheap earbuds like with mm -hmm. the little rubber tips and just put them in your ears. You know, before we do any of the testing, we typically check to make sure there's no fluid in the ears for. For kids, especially where we live, it's pretty common mm -hmm. to have um, an ear infection or something like that. So we have to rule that out before we start looking at hearing detection. That requires us to put um, a little mm -hmm. probe into the ear to take that measurement. And if we can't get to that point, you know, we don't get the measurement. So mm -hmm. having children familiar with people touching their ears or having earbuds in or something in their ear comfortably, safely, mm -hmm. um, will make all the difference in the world to us right. and to the child. Yeah, it'll just make it a much more pleasant visit from the kiddo's perspective too, because it's scary to come in and um, get poked and prodded. But if you look at it like it's a fun game, um, then it goes much more smoothly. Yep. Um, one other thing, just as children get older, we will start testing them just like adults. Um, our son, for example, he, he's about to turn four, but we were testing him like an adult much younger. I mean, it, it was about two years old. He was able to say, yeah, I heard it. And there are kids that can do that. And again, it varies per kid. So it's not, um, it, it's not abnormal or normal or anything like that. It's just, it depends on the kiddo. Um, so we are prepared to test children in any way we, we can to get those reliable responses. But once they hit, definitely by school age, typically kids are able to, to tell you tell us if yeah. they're hearing a sound and then we're able to test them just like you would an adult mm -hmm. all right so we're going to put a pretty red bow on this whole thing let's let's kind of recap uh, this was a very broad overview right. of how we test kids um, we'll go probably into more depth into some of these techniques like um, auditory brain stem responses and and things like that in future episodes but i'd like to cap everything off by saying it's very important for parents and for physicians and, and pediatricians to find an audiologist who is skilled 
and um, has experience with kids. Mm -hmm. Every audiologist doesn't particularly have the same skill set as another one. Um, so find somebody who's really comfortable with kids. Look at Google reviews and things like that. Um, if it's an audiologist that you know, find somebody that you're comfortable with and that you know your children are feel comfortable with. That's one thing that we try to do in our clinic is make the kiddos feel as comfortable as we can mm -hmm. because we get so much more out of them, but they get so much more out of the experience as well. We don't want that child to feel uh, scared or anything right. like that when they're here, especially if we have to have a return visit. Right. So uh, I guess my takeaway from this would be find somebody who's good with working with kids, who's comfortable with working mm -hmm. with kids, and who can adapt really easily because every single kid is different. You're not going to test one kid the same as you're going to test the other in most cases. Right. Yeah. So what's your takeaway? Uh, my takeaway would be if you know you're going to have your child tested, um, have their hearing tested, call ahead to the place you're going to go and just ask, what can I do to prepare for this visit? We have had some some guardians and parents call in and say, hey, what what? how do you test? What do I need to be doing at home to prepare? And that will just make it so much easier if you have those, those preparation activities. Yep. Well, we hope this little short episode about testing kiddos will help you uh, when you're getting ready to test your kid or grandkid um, or have them tested. But if you have any other questions, just give us a call at the office, 304-428-2403. Shoot us an email at info, I-N-F-O, at herewv.com. Make sure to like and subscribe um, if you like what you saw. And uh, leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. Yeah. But until next time. Thank you. See ya.